Welcome back to the Crossboard Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, the host. And today, uh, I hope you are with us all day because we have episode after episode after episode every two hours coming out until about six o'clock tonight. So please bear with us and stay with us because we have lots of candidates who we want to get through and talk to and about their campaign and their candidacy. But today on this Friday before Election Day, we're going to start up here in the Northeast with Ward 5 candidate Tudor Dinka. Tudor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Great, uh, great to be here, Chris. Uh, hello to your viewers as well. Uh, thank you so much for giving the candidates from all over the city uh, an opportunity to speak about their platform and about their ideas, especially in a context where uh, a lot of the mainstream media just tends to focus on the mayoral race and does not give as much attention to the councillors, and they should since they each get a vote on council. They, they each get a vote and our mayoral system is very weak. It's one vote for that mayor and they that's about it. So unless you have eight votes, you don't have anything, you can't do anything. So that's why I'm focusing on the wards. But let's talk about yourself. Uh, if you've listened to the show before, you know the first question that's gonna be coming out of my mouth and that is, where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Right, so, um, you know, <laughs> My background, uh, the way I actually got interested in politics and, and trying to run to become a, an elected official was uh, when I was younger, like many kids, I actually wanted to be a doctor, uh, you know, wanted to help people. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I saw somebody bleed at a young age and I almost fainted. So I kind of realized that this is not going to work. And then as I got a bit older, I remember uh, sitting with my grandfather in the room. He was watching TV and there was an old man on television and my grandfather was so irritated that he turned off the TV within an instant. And I asked my grandfather, grandpa, like, why did you turn off the TV? And he said, that old man, he's older than me and he's still in politics. And that really left an impression with me because I, why would my grandfather give so, so much like importance? Why would he be so impacted by an old man just talking on television? And then the older I got and the more I learned about, you know, uh, political science, society, the role of politicians in that society, I came to realize that uh, elected officials can have a tremendous impact. Um, in a way, uh, I like to think of them as social doctors, where, where a doctor takes care of you one at a time. Uh, a politician, elected official, uh, can impact thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people if they put in good policy. Of course, they can also damage uh, many lives <laughs> with the reverse. And that's why the word politician is so divisive. But it, I still believe, and uh, in, in time, this, this optimism does decrease, but uh, I still believe that uh, elected officials have the uh, amazing power to have positive impact upon society. And in a way, uh, my, um, I would like to fulfill my dream of becoming a doctor, but more in the sense of a social doctor, to do, do good in society through the good policies that I can help push forward. Now, if, for those who don't know, for those my listeners and to my viewers and the people of Ward 5, you haven't been able to reach out to yet, but I, I know that you probably are this weekend and up until Monday at 8 o'clock when polls close. You ran in 2017. You, you were on the ballot in 2017 and you've put your name forward again in 2021. Um, why do it again? Why put your name forward in 2021? What was the issue in this election that you said, I need to get back on the ballot because for the last four years, this issue hasn't been addressed? Absolutely. So I did, uh, I did around 2017. There were a number of issues um, you know, that I thought needed to be addressed. One of them, for example, was the issue of urban sprawl. Um, you know, as somebody who's been fortunate enough to live in Europe, work in my home country, visit other places around the world, um, there's a distinct urban planning tendency in North America, and some of the developing world has actually taken this up, which is to uh, build uh, suburban neighborhoods, but they don't have proper infrastructure to follow uh, with that building. And, you know, as somebody who loves history and looking at Calgary's maps a long time, we've increased uh, immensely, you know, 1950. Calgary had a population of 125,000 people. Then in 1975, we got up to 500,000. And today we're at 1.3, 1.4 million, you know, depending on how you measure that. And another important aspect of that history is that until 1950, Calgary really developed like a city based on Anglo-Saxon ideas or like design. But after 1950, with the, the 19, I think it was 1947 discovery of Leduc, 
what we get is this big influx of American influence, especially down the Midwest and Texas. And we have mayors like Don McKay and Harry Hayes that as they see these influx of uh, American influence companies asking cities like Austin, Houston, you know, and, and just Texas, the Texas model, hey, what are we going to do? We're getting so many office spaces. We're getting all this kind of investment, but we don't know what to do with our city. We're growing tremendously. And they basically said, I'm obviously paraphrasing, just do what we're doing, which is tear down your old heritage buildings downtown, build skyscrapers for your oil and gas companies, and build a lot of roads because people are going to want to have their big backyards in the suburb, uh, suburbs. And this has been an urban planning tradition. It has had a bit of a pushback in the last five to 10 years, but not as much as I would like to see. Uh, but that's been a tendency. And that's why we've seen such tremendous growth, at least in footprint, into the city. Um, and coupled with that, it's, the, it's, again, the American planning where, yes, we're building these suburbs, but we're not building the amenities that go with it, uh, like public transportation, recreational spaces. But overall, the biggest one, the biggest, if you want, umbrella issue is that urban planning aspect. And within that umbrella, there is, again, public transportation, public spaces, uh, sustainable development, and so on. So that's really the main one, because I did not see anything get changed in the last four years. As an example, former Councillor Shahal, now the current member of Parliament, he was actually part of the councillors that voted for 14 new communities in 2019, even though, if I'm not mistaken, the city administration recommended eight or nine, but they voted for 14. So that was to me another indicator that uh, unfortunately what I was advocating for in 2017 uh, was not getting addressed uh, at all, or at the very least in very, very, very small margins. The Northeast part of Calgary, I'm in Ward 10. It's a relatively common knowledge that I've been saying that. I, I'm in 10 and you're right above us in five and nine are probably the three fastest growing uh, communities wards in this area with ward five being the north northern part of ward five skyview ranch uh redstone there's a lot of development going on up there ward nine it's going off to the side the devil in the devil's advocate in me says sure. growth is good growth is great more people come to our city that's great that means more people are living here that means our taxes are going to go down can you tell us, tell me, and tell my viewers and my listeners what the difference between sprawl and growth is? Because I think there's a disconnect between people who look at what you're saying and saying, well, does it, does it mean that you're advocating that you don't want to grow our city and continue to grow our city in the, uh, a sustainable way? Or how do you, how do you balance that? Absolutely. So again, you know, it's good to make uh, comparisons with other cities around the world. So I'll, I'll start with this one to, to make that distinction and why it's important for us to understand that we can't keep sprawling. So Calgary is the fourth largest city in Canada at the moment, right? It, it, it hells itself like we want to be part of the big boys club, which is Vancouver, Montreal and Toronto. But if you just look at Vancouver, for example, you have, for example, uh, Vancouver, you have uh, uh, Richmond, you have Burnaby and you have North Vancouver. These four areas of the greater Vancouver area, you could fit in Calgary's footprint, but there's one important distinction. All those four areas, they all have their own city hall. And because they've realized that only up to a certain extent, if you continue sprawling, if you continue having a certain footprint, can you manage that area appropriately? Once you get too big, you basically get diminishing returns on what you get on your money. And the only way you can uh, supplement that is if you get higher density within your borders. In fact, I remember reading a city of Calgary document comparing property taxes between Calgary and Vancouver. And I can't remember what year it was specifically, but it, it said that the average house in Vancouver was $1.2 million, very expensive. But the property tax on that was around $3,000, $3,500. Whereas in Calgary, the average house price was $450,000 but the, the average property tax was between $2,000 to $5,500. So proportional to the value of the house, Calgarians are paying significantly more property tax. And that's because Vancouver has done its growth on the vertical, getting more density per square kilometer. We haven't. I actually, a couple of days ago, I had a conversation with the Calgary Fire Fire Association and they, and they, uh, and they mentioned that, like, you know, we, our density is uh, fighting against us and being able to get a more tax revenue, more taxpayer base in order to provide these services across the city. And they are, they are one of the organizations that are challenged by that. So I'm not against growth. I've been, again, I, in Europe, 
in uh, Southeast Asia, there are plenty of cities that continue to grow, that continue to attract the young people and people from other corners of their own countries that want to go into these di dynamic high energy urban centers. But the way they approach uh, growth is different. They look way more at smart urban planning. Uh, they look at way more on how to address uh, those communities that cannot afford a second car uh, and to better integrate, to make it more efficient with public transportation and other resources. And might I add, because uh, I did mention earlier the comparison to, to Texas, we have another important distinction, and it's that we are a significantly colder place than all these other places in the United States that we model ourselves after. Uh, and the fact that for the last 70 years, we haven't really addressed that in our urban planning is really counterproductive. A Texan, if it's you know January or February, they can they can drive away somewhere for a warmer temperature. They could fly to California or Miami, uh, or, but we don't have that option in Calgary. So the fact that we haven't built our suburbs or at the very least our spaces to accommodate that winter uh, climate is another serious question about how we do our urban planning. You have a few days left, less than 72 hours until polls open on election day here. People have already started to vote. We have record turnouts. So I'm going to ask this in a weird way, but try to answer it if you can. If not, then I'll try sure. and re reword it in a different way. You have talked to probably countless people across Ward 5. You have talked to a lot of residents and... I'm assuming when you're talking to them, you're hearing the concerns that they have on at, at, at the doorstep and what they what their concerns are. Under your on your website, which is two door four ward five, which will be linked in the show notes, highly recommend you check it out. Um, you have your platform. You have one, two, three, four, five, six ideas on platforms that are just basic. And the, these are the staples of your website the platform. I got to mm -hmm. ask the question, when you're talking to Ward 5 residents, when you're talking to people who are going to be voting for you, are the platform ideas that you have on your website matching up with what you're hearing at the doorstep? And for those who don't know and haven't, uh, haven't checked it out before this episode, I'm just going to read off the, the highlights of the platform, which are fund new public infrastructure, strengthen public safety, provide better public services, build sustainable neighborhoods, invest in community-led re regeneration, ensure smart and responsible spending. Are you hearing that at the door? Are you hearing that from residents of Ward 5, that these are things that, they're, uh, that are important to them? Um, it's a combination. And obviously, some of those overlap with what constituents have to say, but some of them is what I bring to the table from a macro point of view. You know, the reality is an elective official is obviously there to listen, but he's also there to educate. And the average persons, uh, sometimes those that might not be as interested in policy and politics and the macro issues, might not be as exposed uh, to some of these concerns. And I think it's essential that elected officials, although they, they need to listen to their constituents, of course, but they also need to bring a different perspective on uh, what the residents see or how the residents perceive as their main issues, right? Some people might ask, okay, um, some people might say, well, okay, our transit is the way it is because we've been doing this for such a long time. Yes, you know, uh, change is incremental and, and culture, once it does something for decades, it becomes the norm. But some, some uh, issues, some policy areas need to be challenged. And that might not come necessarily from the average uh, person, but it's the person who's really involved and is looking at all the different, uh, the different levels uh, when trying to run for public office. So how have you thought differently at the, on this election? Because uh, I've, I've, I've encountered many candidates throughout my time. I've encountered many politicians throughout my time. And they say what you've just said. Uh, you need to think differently. That's great. But when you get into office, you, that thinking differently goes completely sidetracked and it doesn't happen. So how, how have you thought differently about this election and the, the, the challenges that Ward 5 faces? And how will you bring that to City Hall when elected on October on Monday? Right. So to give you an example of that, um, we have to I'll give you an example of the one of my main topics that I discussed in the campaign, which is the blue line. For many people that don't know, the Blue Line LRT is the uh, C train that runs from Saddletown in the Northeast to 69 from the Southwest uh, in 2012. In the North Northeast, it got expanded by two stations from West Winds all the way to Saddletown. And also in 2012, uh, the, the Southwest leg was completed from downtown all the way to 69th. What's interesting there is, just to give you a bit of background on that as well, 
I'm not sure if you know this, but do you know how much per kilometer it costs to extend the, the blue line all the way to Saddletown and then per kilometer to finish the Southwest Lake? I don't, but I'm assuming I'm about to get an education in what it is. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I put it in my blog post called Where is the Blue Line? And when they finished that extension from Westminster to Saddletown, the city spent per kilometer around $50 million in the Northeast. Um, now, uh, that sounds quite a bit, and it's not cheap to say the least, because you can't compare total amount because the distances are different. So it wouldn't yeah. be fair. You have to do by kilometer. But in the Southwest, uh, and there's, a, there's an article I linked into my uh, blog post, uh, by Jesse Klein, the cost in the Southwest Lake was 194 million per kilometer. That is four times more. And the reason it was four times more is because they had to dig on the ground. Westbrook Station is the first station that was uh, the first station on the ground downtown Calgary. They have to build over at the Greyhound bus station. You have the Sonalta, which is up in the, which is elevated. And the last station on 69th is underground as well. And this is, this is not to mention that if you compare the last stations on each end of the line, with about 700 meters to grow, the last station is built on the ground. Where for you, if you lived in the Northeast, Chris, I'm sure maybe you've been to the Saddletown Circle, the way the Saddletown station has been built, it's at street level. And every time, especially during rush hour, uh, an LRT train passes through there, it's a nightmare. Um, and that shows you poor design. And do you know what the time difference is when they completed the Saddletown station, the 69th station? Four months. That is the difference when they opened it. So it's not that they finished Saddletown and they said, oh my goodness, we really messed this up. We got to make sure when we finish 69th, we build it on the ground so that we're being proactive. No, the city made a conscious decision, maybe for cost reasons or for other reasons that I have not found yet, but cost seems to be the main one, that they built the extension of far up into the Northeast at street level instead of building it on the ground. And in fact, if people go and, and see the other documents that I put about the future of the LRT, something that uh, I, I, I brought up in our debate, um, the reality is they are planning to build at still street level and they're debating if the Savannah station, which is the next one, is going to be street level or underground. But there has been no community engagement on this topic whatsoever. And the last time the maps have been touched by the city of Calgary was in March 2019. Now you can make the argument, look, we don't have uh, the money to build it, although we have apparently enough money to build a 5.5 green line segment, whereas in the extension to 128th, is going to be 700, by the recent estimates is November 2020, is going to be 723 million. This means that if we get the same commitment from the provincial and federal government and the city, of course, they each only have to contribute $240 million, which is significantly smaller than the current commitment of 1.5 billion for a line that's now only going to go for Shepherd to Eau Claire. It doesn't even cross the borough up to 16th. Yeah. So if when you're asking me, how am I seeing differently? Uh, again, it's because of my international experience. It's me really caring about this kind of stuff and paying attention. And it's about me doing the homework. It's not just political talk. Uh, man, it, the amount of candidates, regardless of war, that are using the word change, uh, I think, uh, or, or together we can, or something like that, I think uh, some older politicians are going to get a lot of royalties <laughs> from, from the cliche. But, but the substance of that change is not in you just uh, putting that label on a, on a campaign sign. It's what is your policy? What is the substance of that policy and how you plan to do it? And once I have that information, once I get elected and I put it on the table of city administration, they, they have to provide an answer. Why are we prioritizing an LRT line, which is important. I'm not saying the green line is not important, but, but why are we not talking about the blue line in parallel to this? In an area of the city, as you well know, the geography is much easier, it's flat. The amount of obstacles are significantly smaller, especially four years ago when we didn't have airport trail, we didn't have neighborhoods that were being built, we didn't have underground utilities that would present bigger challenges and, and other variables. But now, again, because the city is really poor planning, there are more communities being built, airport trail has been almost concluded, it's not quite finished, but it's almost concluded. Uh, they have utilities on the ground. All of these are additional risk factors. That, that is going to mean that the capital project is not going to be ever hit on the dot. They might have at least a margin of error 10 to 25%. But none of this has been the conversation. Only one candidate now in the mayoral race has brought up the topic of extending the blue line. But for the last five years, uh, it, uh, most candidates have been mute, especially in the Northeast. But now it's becoming an issue. But the longer we wait, the more expensive it's going, going to get. 
I want to talk about the Northeast a little bit, and it goes into this whole uh, building sustainable, building neighborhoods, building sustainable neighborhoods, because uh, I don't need to tell you, Ward 5 is one of the most diverse wards in the city. Everyone says theirs is, but you look at the demographics, you look at the communities in the Northeast, and it is diverse. How does your background best make you how does the how does your background make you the best candidate to represent all of the diverse communities that makes up ward five because i, I want to know because there's a lot of languages spoken and sometimes you're not going to be able to speak all languages that people are going to want to speak to you so how will you best represent everyone no, absolutely. I wish I could speak uh, all the languages that are spoken in the <laughs> Northeast Calgary. Uh, I think I think then I, I would have even uh, even more appeal as a candidate. But unfortunately, uh, I am limited to only three languages so far. So um, yes, without a doubt, you know uh, I am an immigrant as well. So I think I understand that immigrant experience. Of course, not all immigrant experiences are the same, depending on what part of the world you come from, depending on your theological background, depending on the culture. No experience is going to be identical, and you know what? No elected official can represent all the people of their ward. But in this key essential, uh, in this key essential category, what is the Northeast, which is a very diverse place. In fact, I think there's only one constituency in Vancouver and one in Toronto that has a much that has even a more diverse makeup. Calgary's Northeast is the third most diverse makeup in Canada, just to get an idea of the scale. Um, but even though you know I, I don't share some commonalities with some certain ethnic groups, I do share that common immigrant experience. And a big part of the reason that I'm running is because I do remember when I was young, when I immigrated to Canada, I was 13. I do remember my parents and how hard they worked. Uh, especially the first four or five years in Canada as an immigrant, you do not go back, you do not come to Canada on the same level you were back home. Uh, you do not have the same occupation. You do not have the same credential being recognized for your education, uh, language barriers. And more importantly, you don't have the same network. That's the biggest one. Uh, that's probably the thing that helps you most in life, the fortune of your network and how uh, the people around you can help you move up the social ladder. And a lot of immigrants, when they when they come, they choose to get rid of that, or at the very least, leave that back home and in favor of what they hope to build better into their new adoptive country. And I know that experience. And uh, you, I didn't really realize it that much when I was a teenager, when my dad was driving me to soccer in between work him working two jobs. Uh, same with my mother, uh, how busy she was at home working and had a job working. You don't realize that as a teenager, but when you uh, grow older and you uh, you know done your research and you pay attention to this stuff, especially somebody like me who has a background in public policy, you realize that that detail matters a lot when it comes to public engagement and uh, what it matters to, like, uh, to people, the way they get involved. In the end, democracy is above everything else participatory. If you don't participate, your voice is not the same. There's other flaws to it, of course, but that is an essential, that is an essential detail. If you don't participate in it, uh, you you won't have your voice heard. And that's what I'm hoping to do if I do get elected. I hope to be able to provide more education, more opportunities, more resources for the residents of Ward 5, uh, especially the new immigrants, but more even equally as important, their children to get involved. Um, you know, I thankfully, because I've had an interest in this field since I was a teenager, uh, I have always asked the questions, how are our schools, how are our roads, how is our public transportation? Most young people don't most young people, until they have a family and they have to look outside of themselves, uh, that's when they start reflecting on the importance of institutions, their stability, their access. Uh, and the quicker we get more residents of War 5 to be more involved and to put some energy to the side for these kind of activities, which are essential uh, in regards to their relation with the city, the better War 5 will be. And I'm hoping to be a, a promoter of that. I want to talk about uh, opinions because... As the councillor, you mentioned it there briefly there for a second, but I want to dive a little bit more into it. You will be there to represent your constituents, the people of Ward 5. Um, so how do you balance the needs of your constituents against your own opinions? Do you look at the people of Ward 5 and say, if I'm elected, I will represent your wants and your needs, and I will take my direction from you? Or... Will you look at them and have that conversation with anyone who wants it and say, 
let's let's have a conversation let's come to a best solution that will please everyone how do you balance your your wants and needs against what your constituents want i i i think um I, I would just change a bit of the wording there, and I would say that I would try to please as as most as possible. Uh, okay. Everyone will be it will be an impossibility. Um, I think yes, you're right. Uh, you know, it, it all comes down to dialogue. Uh, what I see is it, it is a sensitive balance, and what I would do is, um, especially on the topics that I'm very well versed, I would bring that. In the topics that I'm not. I would leave that to the professionals, even the ones that I'm well-versed. I want other professionals as well. I don't want to fall in this false trap that I have all the answers. But then I, I will ask them that, you know, in this dialogue that we're going to have between us representative and, your, and, the, uh, and the constituents, that they keep an open mind, that they have patience, that we discuss all the details. We have to make sure that we're not being impulsive. You know, in my culture, we say it is better to measure something 100 times and only cut it once and totally measure it a couple of times and cut it 10 times. And we want to make sure we do that. And um, there is, I'll give you one example, another example. Um, the turf field at the Genesis Center has been opened. And you know what? I'll give credit where credit is due. Uh, it has, uh, uh, George did a great job getting the funding for that. It took a big long, three and a half years since he talked about it, but it's done. And we don't have a field of that level in the Northeast that we have now. Uh, so it's, it's a great success. However, uh, a lot of people were very content and happy with it because we don't have any. So the bar is set really low. And what I would like to see is that anytime a new turf field gets announced or anything like that, we have to ask the question, okay, where is the next one? We should have a, a five kilometer policy rule where every time you put in a new artificial field or, or field at a high standard, the next one has to be either five kilometers north or five kilometers south. This would encourage uh, urban development to not only rely on the automobile, but on people to take public transportation, young kids to bike to those facilities, and uh, and why not walk if you're not that far from it? Um, but but you have to you have to give that bigger picture perspective because some people say will say oh, I'll just get it done, or I'll give you another example. And I and I've written about this on my blog post. It's the Cornerstone Commercial Area. The new Northeast communities do not have a property grocery store. And this has been a big concern in that area because they either have to drive to the superstore uh, near to Martindale there by West Winds, or they have to go to other locations outside of like their vicinity. Now, the developer there recently announced that they are going to put a corner store, uh, uh, a grocery store. But in the article that I wrote, if you look there, the Calgary Planning Commission only voted four to three in favor of it. And it was actually one of the mayoral candidates that it was the tying vote that break, broke it. If you watch the whole video of the session, even the people that voted for it pointed out to the design flaws of it, which is that you basically built another commercial area where the stores are on the outside of the commercial area and you have a big parking lot in the middle. These are basically spaces that you usually have more like in, in, in spaces that are not neighborhoods where you have to drive there every single time. However, this location is gonna be in the middle of Cornerstone. It's gonna be really close to Skyview. It's gonna be really close to Redstone. Why wasn't the design made in such a way so that encouraged more pedestrian friendly, more community based, a space where you can go sit at a cafe with a friend and catch up if you're on to go for a stroll. And the reason is the design is made to invite people that are driving on country hills that might come off Stony or Deerfoot to come in and turn into the space. And as soon as that got announced, there were a lot of residents of Ward 5 that were like, oh, fantastic, finally we got it. You know, after seven, eight years of waiting for it, we finally got it. Okay, I get it, we need it, but it's so poorly designed. You know, it, it is so archaic. It is a model that's been done 20, for 20, 30 years. And considering the amount of family, the amount of young people, the amount of either uh, lack of spaces that the new Northeast has, it could have been done much better. So that's what I'm hoping to bring to the conversation. Okay, I know you like this, can we make it better? How can we do that, right? And and that's what I'm hoping to bring to the dialogue. I I, I love that you mentioned grocery store because I, I recently chatted with a school board trustee for Ward Five and Ten, and she said that and the thing that is also missing in the north part of uh, the ward is a school, a public school that kids can actually go to. So, the Northeast has been I, I, I hate to say forgotten because I it, no one's ever forgotten in this city. It's just we have to spend our money wisely. And I ask this now with that in mind, you will be there to represent your ward, Ward 5, 
But at the end of the day, you are also there to represent the city of Calgary. You have to make decisions best for the city and not just yourself and the ward. So how do you balance that? How do you balance the needs of your city against the needs of your ward? Yes, you're right. This is this is difficult because it's tough because the reality is Ward Five has really gotten the short end of the stick for a long time, you know. And and of course, you know, I've been uh, I have friends all over the city, and the reason I have friends all over the city is because a lot of them that I made used to grow up in the Northeast, and as soon as they got to adult age, they had families, they moved out into other areas of the city that had better amenities. This shows a discrepancy in the service delivery or the planning in the different colleges of the city. Um, of course, I do think, you know, projects like the Green Line are essential. I think that uh, projects like, you know, the BMO Center are important for us to have more activities. So there are, there are projects that want to have the city in mind. But I think if you look at the history and the lack of advocacy for the Northeast, I do will have to prioritize Ward 5 until we get some of those major projects going. Uh, such as seeing some pr a proper community engagement and some funding put to the side for the Blue Line extension, such as as priority on the recreational facility. I'm sure you've heard about this topic as well. This was another thing that got promised with three months before an election. I don't know uh, how you feel, but where I come from, uh, when a politician promises me something three months before an election, I doubt the long-term uh, uh, commitment to that. So, uh, and, and even there, the city admitted that there were, I think, six recreational facilities that they admitted that the last one will be completed in 2027, so six years from now. There is no guarantee that the Sky uh, that the Skyview uh, recreational facility is going to be prioritized up that list. So until I said like the blue line, until we see the prioritization of that recreational facility um, and uh, I, and maybe something else, uh, I I I will have to put War Five first. It's again, I understand the bigger picture. I understand it has to be a balance. I don't want to seem selfish. But anybody who uh, has talked to me and I explained the, the issues that are in the Northeast and they compare it to other places around the city, they are amazed. Like the numbers I gave you about the Blue Line extension in the Southwest. Uh, when you look at the lack of recreational facilities, as you see in other places in the city, um, they, they, they remain amazed. And again, the proof is in the pudding. I have a lot of friends and acquaintances that grew up in the Northeast with me in high school who no longer live in the Northeast. And that's gotta be for a reason. I, I, I want I, I, there's a running joke in our household and I have learned this since I was a kid and I, I'm going to give you an analogy now. There's five seasons technically in, in, in Canada. There's summer, spring, fall, winter, and election season. And election season is also called construction season because right before an election, everything seems to get fixed or starts to get fixed or gets money thrown at it. So when I hear politicians say something about, oh, we're funding this in six years, I'm going, oh, election's coming. coming yeah. and, and I'll give you an example just because it's a bit more literal, but talk about like the city how the way it plans projects since you live in war 10 you're familiar with 52nd Falcon Ridge boulevard turns into 52nd and right now they're in the middle of an important uh, brt expansion uh, of that street which is great i think it's a great project but if you look you know if you walk down the street there and if you look at the sidewalks they are still being redone as they were built you know 30 40 years ago they're not made into multi-purse paths there's no like bike locking stations there's no enhancement besides just the project what it is there and that's an indicator that the city has not thought long term on how can we make this road better the question should be especially in established neighborhoods how do we break up this neighborhood as if we built it in 2021 2022 and, and so on and so on but right now we don't see that and again like you said a lot of the building is done during the campaign time it looks good but is it good how good is the, the actual execution I agree. I want to turn to the future now because uh, we're about 30 minutes into the interview and I, I, you have a campaign to run and win. So I want to make sure that we get, get this in. I want you to jump forward to October 19th. So the day after the election, October 18th, uh, I, I would say the mainstream media, but I'm going to say tune into the Cross Border Interview podcast at seven o'clock live Absolutely. by YouTube because that's where we'll be covering the election results. We call the election for you. So October 19th, you wake up, you are now councillor elect for Ward 5 in the city of Calgary. What's priority number one for you? Yeah, so priority number one is, uh, as I understand it, the budget is going to be discussed uh, in November. 
So the priority for me is to really get uh, better educated on the process and to better understand the different categories that the budget covers. Uh, we are in a very interesting situation where um, some candidates I mentioned is that the city had a surplus, but that surplus was actually as a result of the grants that we received from the provincial and the federal government due to COVID. And because we had to shut down so many facilities and spaces as a result of COVID. It's not like we were running on, on maximum capacity and then, oh, look, we, we have all this money. The context is key uh, and that, that should be brought up. And now we are turning back the dial, trying to get back to some sense of normality. Um, and that's going to be interesting how that's going to impact the numbers because the numbers are not going to be impacted while we have those estimates in November. It's going to be, it should be in stages as we open up more and more up. And, and that's what, that has to be, that has to be really analyzed really well. And for us to understand how do we gradually open that up so that we can manage our, uh, our finances in a sustainable way so that's not as little impact as possible on average Calgarians. And in doing so, then we can talk about that surplus uh, and how we can use that. And I'm hoping that part of that surplus can at the very least be towards, um, you know, community development, such as uh, public spaces in the new Northeast, the Blue Line LRT, and, and other issues that the Northeast needs. But the budget on the whole, on a macro level has to be looked at because again, it's a very, it's gonna be a fluid situation. You know, our vaccination numbers are quite high and that hopefully is gonna allow us to really open up, uh, uh, you know, over the holiday break and as we get into the spring. But again, that, yeah, exactly, fingers crossed. But again, we have to also have the flexibility in case that doesn't happen as quickly. And we have to be realistic about that. I, 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 I can't believe I forgot to mention it because I've done enough of these and you think it would be ingrained in my head right now. But I, we should talk about COVID-19 for a second here because uh, you alluded to it. The vaccine numbers are high, but the Northeast was hit the hardest. It was hit the hardest. People had to work. They had to go to their work still. Uh, they did it. Uh, we had high uh, high uh, rates of COVID within the Northeast, Ward 5, Ward 10. We had a premier say that it's because of the Northeast we had that issue. I want to know from you, what are you hearing from residents about COVID-19 in Ward 5? And are they looking towards the future? Are they or, or are they still concerned that a fourth wave, a fifth wave, a potential sixth wave, knock on wood, it doesn't happen, but it could happen still? I haven't really heard any particular fears in the long term. I think, um, as you may know, the rate of vaccination is really high in the Northeast, especially in the now, now after, after some time and after the resources are put there to make it more accessible for the different uh, communities. Uh, as we talked about earlier, you know, the uh, Northeast has a lot of people that work, especially since there's a lot of large immigrant community, those jobs that are frontline jobs are at the very least in essential spaces that uh, you can't avoid. And, and you can't not only avoid because of the nature of the work, you can't avoid because of your nature of status in Canada as a recent arrival, that you really depend on these jobs in order for your family. And there's obviously cross-generational homes and, and other variables. But as soon as that detail was being addressed, uh, Northeast Calgary has some of the highest vaccination rates, I think, in, in, in Alberta, especially in the most vulnerable groups, which are usually between 50 and 80 and so on, right? So, so we're happy to see that. I, I don't see that fear because... From the people that I talk to, you know, when I door knock, what I usually do is I put in the postcard on the side of the door, uh, then I ring the doorbell, and then I walk about 10 feet away from the door to keep the distance, because you never know how comfortable a person is going to be. And I've had, I've had constituents that came actually close to me, and, and I told them, well, as long as you're comfortable, uh, you know, I'm fine, but as long as you're comfortable, and they said, you know, I got the vaccine, I feel comfortable. So they have a, they have a, uh, they have a trust in the science, they, they've done their duty. And I really appreciate him doing that. So I don't see a fear for that. But again, awesome. we we still need to be uh, we still need to be uh, cautious and proactive uh, because again, uh, it's people's livelihoods and and um, and this and you know the things that got limited over the last couple of years have impacted a lot of Calgarians in different ways. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. And I apologize for throwing that in there. But I you said COVID nineteen, and I literally went. How did I not ask that question during our first part of this interview? But I want to turn back to the future now because um, I, 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 I ask this question because if you are elected on Monday, I want to sit down with you in 100 days because this question is important to me. In 100 days, 
what metrics are you going to look at to say, I have been successful in the first mm. three months of my counselorship? I want to be able to go back to the people of Ward 5 and I've got X, Y, and Z done, or I've started on X, Y, and Z, and I have been successful in those. So that way, in 100 days, when I sit down with you, I can say, did you get them done? So what are those metrics that you're putting in place to be successful in your first 100 days? Great. Well, please have your pen ready. Well, you probably don't need it because you, you're recording, so it'll be fine regardless. But um, no, that's a very good question. And you're right. We need measuring sticks in order to keep uh, not only ourselves, but our elected officials honest. Um, some, of the, some of the things that we like to prioritize in the first 100 days, I am going to go to the communities of uh, um, Cityscape, Cornerstone, Skyview already has a community association, but especially Redstone, that's in the middle of it. And I want to solidify that they complete or at the very least start the process of creating their own community associations. Uh, community associations are essential in engaging with the city in regards to bylaws, projects, and other relationships that you can have with the city. And the crazy thing is we have communities in the new Northeast that do, uh, that have had, you know, uh, residents in those neighborhoods for eight, almost 10 years. And I said, with the exception of Skyview, there is no community association for the other communities. Redstone is in the early stages of getting it, but I have not seen much progress on it. So I want to be an engine to that. So that would be one measurement uh, that I would do. Um, second one is, uh, community engagement with the established neighborhoods. How many sessions are we going to have? We have to have the sessions on the budget in the, in the spaces that we can. Uh, again, depends on the COVID measures and how much we can have those kind of public uh, gatherings. Uh, more than likely not, the way uh, the, just to, to play it safe. But, but it still matters that through uh, digital media, through uh, Zoom meetings such as this and that kind of stuff, you can still do community engagement. So that's also essential, especially because of the budget. Um, uh, and, and that's why it's important. Um, and really, through the motions that a council can put forward, uh, I would put on mo uh, motions forward in regards to the recreational uh, facility that I talked about in Skyview, and in regards to the blue line, to at the very least start a community engagement on those topics. So I think those would be four important measuring sticks. Of course, uh, I will get a better idea once I get elected on how tough the terrain is to move through it at that pace. But I think those are four things that I feel more than comfortable you uh, keeping me honest in 100 days. Awesome. Glad to hear that. And I look forward to the conversation. My last question for you, and this is more not more of a, it's not a question, it's more of a statement. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to you for as long as you want it. For the people of Ward 5 who are listening to this right now, who are thinking, okay, I'm not sure who I'm going to be voting for. I'm thinking about somebody. I'm thinking about somebody else. Why should they put their trust in you on election day? Why should they cast their ballot on election day, which is Monday, October 18th, for you? So whenever you're ready, you can take as long as you want, talk to the people of Ward 5 and let them know why they should vote for you. Great. And again, thank you, Chris, for the opportunity. Um, to the residents of Ward 5, I just want to say that um, as they're doing their research, I hope they do take their time to look at the material that I've put out throughout these last three, four months of campaigning that I've done. Uh, if they go to my website and they look under my blog post, they'll see that I've done the hard work of uh, reaching out to the city, grabbing the materials, presenting that material in detailed information, not general ideas, not generally feel good words, but detailed information on where we currently stand in key areas of Ward 5. Obviously, I'm not an expert on every topic, but on the areas that I've looked at, I've done my research and I feel that I'm ready to hit the ground running when I get elected. And that is the type of attitude that I will bring once I get elected. We need to be more participatory in our democracy. Ward 5 has a lot of potential. When I door knock, it's remarkable. The amount of young family with two, three kids, the amount of times I got a young kid answering the door after door knocking is maybe sometimes a bit concerning, but it's, it's great to see because Ward 5 has a, has a bright future, but it's going to be up, first and foremost, to the elected officials at all levels of government to be able to create the environment where those young people will want to live in that area so they can spend time with their families and grow a, a sustainable and rich future there. And I hope that the material, the interviews, the, uh, the debates uh, you know, that I've had shows that I have a passion for the area. I wanted to see it succeed. Uh, I'm very grateful for the friends. Calgary has a lot of flaws. It's by no means perfect, but the people are amazing. And, and regardless of what I think the city's doing and what path is going on the way, 
I am grateful for the friends, basically the family that I've made in the city. And I want an exchange to make a better city for them. So that's what I'm hoping to deliver for Ward 5. I have done a lot of these interviews and I, I, I can tell the authentic candidates against the ones who have, who are doing it for their own personal gains. For the people of Ward 5, I highly recommend you look at people who are running in this campaign because this campaign is important. This election is important. And please get out and vote. Take 90 minutes out of your day and learn about the candidates and learn about who they are. For those who have who've listened to the show in an entirety, you know what I'm about to say. The links to Mr. Adinka's website is in the show notes. The contact information is in the show notes. Get out, get involved. You have 72 hours left in this campaign. I know it's been a 10 month campaign, but you have 72 hours left in this campaign. Get out and get involved. Now, I do want to say this to you, uh, Tudor. There is probably someone right now yelling at their computer screen, their iPhone, their car stereo saying, why didn't you ask him this question? So sure. how can people reach out to you? What's your email address? So my email address is info at tutor number four ward and then the number five dot CA. They can also contact me by phone if they wish at 587-586-5864. Very easy because we don't remember phone numbers anymore. So through that. <laughs> oh, I can make that easy there. Awesome. Um, I want to thank you so much for doing this. To my listeners, to my viewers, like I've said, get involved, get out and get voting and vote for all of the issues that are on the ballot. This is a two-page ballot. It's a weird ballot. I don't know why we have so many elections. I'm so confused half the time. <laughs> but go vote because you need to vote. Uh, we will be back here in less than an hour and a half at the top of the 10 o'clock hour to talk to another candidate in the Northeast, but this time running for school board trustee. Uh, Tudor, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much, Chris, again, for the opportunity. And I look forward to chatting with you uh, after the election as well, hopefully as the Ward 5 counselor. <laughs> and through that. <laughs>